All right, so let's talk optics. So optics and photonics is my area of research, and so it's something I'm passionate about, of course. And so today we're going to build a, an optical projector. Um, before we do that, we first have to understand how refraction works. So many of us are wearing glasses. Uh, the principle of how glasses work is that they refract light. So refract means to bend. Um, and so they allow light to focus on our uh, proper parts of the eye. So I first want to start off this activity with an example where imagine you're a lifeguard. And you spot someone in the water not doing so well. All right. So this is the coastline. This is beach. This is water. OK, has anyone been a lifeguard before? No one's children, as well. children, yeah. Children, you got to always be on the guard. So if you're a lifeguard and you see someone. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you're uh, on the beach and there's someone not doing well in the water. What path would you take from your lifeguard station to this person to help them as quickly as possible? How many people would go in a straight line? Fastest path is through a straight line. So we'll see. So, the, so this is the shortest distance, but is it the fastest? No, you travel faster no. on land. Okay, you travel faster on land than in water. So uh, I run. I'm a marathon runner, so I can run about eight miles an hour for a typical uh, a race. Um, if I'm sprinting, I can get up to 10 miles an hour, maybe 11. Um, in water, I used to also swim. So in water, I can swim like a 17, 18 minute mile. So I, I swim at about four miles an hour. So I can definitely run much faster than I can swim, mm -hmm. right? So knowing that information, how would you change the way that you would approach the problem? Oh, I'm sorry. Can we go back one second? Sure. Because I want to make sure we're all on the same page. You, your question was, which way would you get there? Yeah, so I'm the fastest, the, the fastest way. I want to get from here to there. So this distance versus this distance? Yes, because that's this, this distance is, it's the hypotenuse. It's longer than an in individual side, but it's yeah. shorter It's shorter than the sum of the two. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so should, I run, should I run down the beach and go perpendicular like that? OK, other suggestions? So something like that. Yeah. yeah, so that's the correct answer. Mm -hmm. You want to go somewhere between a straight line mm -hmm. and this angle such that it's perpendicular. And so why is that? It's a trade-off between how fast you can go and how far you can go. So if I were able to run millions of times faster than I can swim, then I want to minimize how much time I'm swimming. So if I can run like a million times faster than I can swim, I would go exactly this path and then go perpendicular. Let's say that I'm crazy, and I'm a super fast swimmer. I'm Aquaman, right? And I can't run on land. In that case, I would go along this path and then go along that path. If I can run and swim at exactly the same speed, I would go the shortest distance along this line. So the path I take really depends on the speed in the two different materials. And this is exactly how lenses work. So a lens, or even just an interface of, let's say, air and glass, light travels faster in air than it does in glass. So the speed of light in uh, air, uh, 300 meters per microsecond, approximately. In glass, it's reduced by about a factor of 1.4, 1.5, depending on that. So typically, if I have, let's say, sunlight, and I look, it's going to refract at an angle. So we work with the perpendicular to the surface between the air and the glass, and we measure angles relative to that perpendicular line. So we talk about this incident angle 
So it's this nice Greek symbol. It looks like an oval with a line across called theta. So the line that we come in at is called theta incident. It's the incident angle of the light. The light gets bent at the interface of the glass into a new angle me measured relative to this perpendicular called theta out. Sometimes this is written theta 1, and this is written theta 2. And Snell's law is basically a solving of the question, what path is the shortest distance from one point to the other? It's also a way to solve what are known as Maxwell's equations, which talk about the relationship between electric and magnetic fields that explain how light propagates. So this solution to the equation allows us to calculate what angle does the light bend at. If you ever look at a glass and you have a straw in the glass, does the straw look straight? No. It's like it goes for a while and then it's displaced and then it continues. This is a result of refraction. So what we want to do in this activity is teach students how, or have students explore, how does the angle of incidence affect the angle of refraction. And in order to do this activity, we're going to shine light at a block of glass that's mounted on a protractor and measure what is the outcome angle as a function of the incoming angle. The relationship says that if this material has a refractive index N2, so the refractive index is the ratio of how fast the, um, or sorry, it's the ratio of the speed of light to how fast the light travels in that material. This is the ratio of how fast it travels in a vacuum compared to the compared to the velocity in this material. Snell's law tells us the relationship of these two angles in terms of these refractive indices. So the refractive index is a ratio of how fast or how much light is slowed down when it travels in a material. And it's a relationship that says that N1 times the sine of the angle theta 1 equals N2 times the sine of the angle theta 2. Now, in order to appreciate this formula, students need to know how what sine and cosine mean. So there's a review session or a review section in the book um, that talks about waves and sines and cosines. How we will introduce this to the STEM club is something that we're still trying to figure out. So the question of whether we first talk about here sine and cosine and now you do this activity or you first do this activity and we give you a table of what sine and cosine is and you just accept it as the truth and later on you discover what it means, um, that's something that uh, we're, we're still trying to figure out what the best way to do is. So what we're going to do in our activity, we're going to have a block of glass, we're going to shine light from a laser beam, and we're going to see how it refracts at the interface of air and glass. Okay, so I'm going to put up the document camera so that we can follow along. And you should have received a copy of the protractor. And you should have one laser pointer per table. And you should have uh, a block of some size. Now, the drawing cutout is for a 2 inch by 4 inch block. Um, your actual one is going to be smaller. Or your one that you're using today is going to be smaller. I'm still trying to get the right size block for the right cost. When you're using the laser pointers or the laser um, lever levels, you have to be extremely careful not to shine it in the eyes of your fellow uh, lab mates. Um, this is a common thing that happens. So don't turn on the laser level until you're ready to do the activity. The instructions for the activity are going to be printed directly on the sheet itself. So the students in the STEM club, they'll just get a sheet and they'll have the supplies to be able to um, do this activity. So the way it explains in the instructions, um, so let me rotate it sideways so it faces correctly. Um, you're going to send light in at a fixed angle. So there's going to be some angle that you pick for your laser level, and that's going to shine light on the block. It's important that the light hit the block exactly at the center of the protractor so that you measure angles correctly. So when the light comes in, it's going to be bent in the same way that we talked about how the swimmer or the lifeguard changes their angle based on the differences in speed. So the light is going to be bent at a certain angle. We want to measure where does the light come out of the block. 
So a very common error that students make when they do this activity, they continue to trace this ray after it's bent and they continue to follow it to wherever it hits the exit or wherever it hits the protractor. And that's not going to be the correct angle. What you need to do is you need to put a dot on the sheet of paper where does the light exit. Once you've recorded that dot, you lift the block up and you draw a line that goes from the center through that dot to measure the output angle. And then you can estimate the refractive index of the block, or basically how much is light being slowed down, by calculating the ratio of sine theta 1 over sine of theta 2. Okay, questions so far? Theta 2 is measured from? Theta 2 is measured relative to 180 degrees. So I would place my block um, here, I would set my laser level, so um, the laser level um, projects a line. So let's say that I'm doing 70 degrees. So, oops, it's off the screen. Okay, so I'm shining the laser light through the center. The block is flush with this edge. The laser hits very uh, centrally. And then I need a pen. Interesting that yours shows up white. Yeah, so it's a, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. Why does it show up white? <laughs> it's a red line. <laughs> Not quite on 70. All right, so let me get it closer. All right. Right on 70, right through the center. All right, so accuracy may not be perfect. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, so I've made a dot as to where the light came out, right? So now I would draw with a straight edge from the center through this dot. And I would mark, probably should extend this axis. So this is theta 2. And this angle is theta 1. So in this case, I would record theta 2 relative to 180 as being 219 minus 180, or 39 degrees. So my estimate would be sine of theta 1, which is 70, over sine of 39. And someone with a calculator? Sine, <laughs> sine of 70 over sine of 39. That would be my estimate. So go ahead and put your block. Um, most of the blocks are the same. They're mostly acrylic. Um, some of the blocks are glass, so you may get a slightly different angle. N1 is 1 because we're in air, yes. Air is, it's, okay, it's like 1.00001 something. It's pretty much the same as vacuum. Yeah, sine of 70 divided by sine of 39. Oh. <laughs> yeah, a lot of students will have calculators on their cell phones, so that's the backup plan. Yeah, it'll have sign. If you rotate your iPhone to, um, or if you rotate your phone to. Okay, sounds good. 1.49. Okay, so this is another opportunity to talk about significant figures. So your students might write 1.49316.84. And that's not an appropriate engineering answer because the angle at which you measured, the precision of that is only two digits of precision. So this ratio probably should be rounded to 1.5, but I think 1.49 is good too. Yeah, well I would round it to two digits. So 1.49 rounded to 1.5. So test it out. 
um, try different angles um, as a sanity check. If you shine it in at zero degrees, what should it come out as? Better be zero. Better be going straight. <laughs> there shouldn't be any bending if it's going straight through the block. Um, and C, so think about what angles would give you the most accuracy. Will you get better accuracy if I shine at a very small angle or if I shine at a very large angle? And why? Yeah. Sure. Um, so when I had, had the laser at this angle, like this, theta 1 is the angle going from 0 degrees to where the laser was coming in, which was at 70 degrees. Yeah, so where I send my laser in, I would measure this angle, so it goes up to 70 degrees. Yes, so in engineering, um, the horizontal axis is, or science and math as well, horizontal axis is zero degrees, counterclockwise is positive angle. 60? 214, but minus 180, so 34. Okay, so then did you calculate the sign of the two? Make sure you 54. Okay. The one that I did uh, on the board, it was 75, or sorry, 70 in and 39, and I got 1.49. Okay. Yeah. Who else had a number that they want to share? Zero and zero. All right. So zero and zero is correct, but you'll get sine of zero, which is zero divided by zero. So this is undefined. Yep. Say it again. So you had. Mm -hmm. And this was. So that's just the angle. So the angle is 15 degrees yeah. and the angle is 8. And when you calculate the sine of 15 degrees, it's a decimal number. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. I think someone else at the table did 15. You had 15. So you had. Mm hmm. It should be close to 1.5. It should be close to what? With 4 degrees. I'm going to guess you're going to, so I don't know what your actual number is, but I'm going to guess it's 1.43. Oh, okay. So that's, that's my guess as to your. <laughs> well, there's a formula for understanding how a sine function operates. It's roughly proportional to the angle when the angle is very small. So his answer of 8 going to 4 means that I should get a number that should scale. So that's my guess, 1.43. But it might not be right. <laughs> the sine of 15 divided by the sine of 4? Yep. No. Nope. Did I go the wrong way? I think you did. You've got to go up. Double it. Double it. OK, so what do you get? 3.710. OK, so I have the math right, but I went the wrong way. So 3.71. All right, so let's uh, reconvene and talk about this. A question, Terry? Okay. You mean just in general with the results or with, with your thing? Okay, so what can influence the accuracy of the measurement? So I mentioned that some angles, you'll get more accurate results than others. Um, based on this, do you think small angles or large angles give you more accuracy? Large. So these two are about the same, and this one, like 4 degrees versus 8 degrees, makes a huge difference. And so the reason is that when you look at this formula, you're dividing by sine of theta 2. And if this number is small and your angle is off by a degree, um, it's enough to completely throw off your estimate. So in a practical application, um, to understand sort of how measurement accuracy can be improved, you should think about how sensitive is your formula to errors. So when you make your measurements, there's always going to be errors in it. And so what you want to do is work in a region where small errors are not going to influence it very much. So sine of 39 versus sine of 40, it's about the same. But sine of 4 degrees versus sine of 5 degrees, completely different. So steeper angles are much better. 
Anyone try 90 degrees? <laughs> what happens if you use 90 degrees? 90 degrees, it doesn't go through the block. If you go slightly less than 90 degrees, like 89 degrees, that's probably the most accurate. Um, the correct answer for this should be about 1.45 to 1.55, depending on the exact uh, material that's used. So what you've learned in the session is that light slows down as it goes through the material, and as a result, it bends or it refracts as it goes through this interface. So now we're going to apply this concept, this idea, to building a projector. So I'm a little bit behind on time, but it's probably better that we go through this activity in full so that you can uh, do it, because it's going to be one of the first few activities that you can do with your students. So, so far, what we've talked about is mostly algebra with the exception of sine. So we somehow have to introduce students to the idea of sine in order for them to do this, or we have to tell them, hey, there's this function, you just have to look it up in a table. The second activity is going to really focus on geometrical optics, so using geometry to see how things are similar triangles and the properties of same similar triangles. So what we want to study is how does a lens work. So imagine that we have this thin lens. The thin lens is made of glass, and because it's made of glass, it's going to bend light. It has curved surfaces to be able to bend light a specific amount. So a uh, lens has something called a focal length, f, so there's a certain distance away from the lens that light will focus. What that means is if I shine a light that's parallel, so there's this axis in the center, this is called the optical axis, it goes through the center of the lens. So it's perpendicular to the lens, right, there's this right angle here, it goes through the center of the lens, and a certain distance away from it, there's a focal length. So if I have light that's parallel to this optical axis, then it focuses through this, well, through this focal length f. So the light will bend like this. Similarly, if I had a line of light like this that's going parallel, it will also go through that focus. So people use magnifying glasses. They like to burn things, um, put it out in the sun. Light shines down. It focuses to a spot. Um, interestingly, there's technology that people are working on, working on called solar photovoltaics. And the idea with that, they have these light concentrators that are basically huge lenses that focus sunlight into a very small region, and in that region they put something that's going to heat up. So for example, um, they have these, uh, these cylindrical rods of oil that they use to heat up, and then they convert that energy into electrical energy because they, they have um, engines to do that conversion. So the lens has a certain focal length f, light that's parallel to the axis gets focused to the certain point f. Similarly, there's an equal distance f on the other side of the lens. And so if I have a ray of light, so imagine that here's where the sun is or here's where a light source is. If I have a ray of light that goes through the focal uh, point, I keep missing. Um, so if I go through the focal point, what would I expect my lens to do? I hope to um, turn to be perpendicular to what's there. So coming through this focal point, through this lens, I should get a ray that's parallel to the axis. And the reason that this happens is because light is reversible. If I, had shine, if I had shown light the opposite direction, it would have gone through and focused through that point. Right? Okay, what about a ray of light that goes through the very center of the lens? What will happen to that? Either it doesn't go through or refracts right back the opposite, the opposite direction. Okay, so let's look at Snell's law. So at this point here, and this drawing is not perfect, um, I should make this a little bit better of a drawing. Yeah. Okay, so let me just... Let me make it much, much thinner. Well, all right, let me fix this a little bit. Okay, at this point in the lens, this is exactly perpendicular. So if the light goes through the very center of the lens, the light is striking the curved surface of the lens at exactly 90 degrees. So based on that, what should happen? It should not bend. So this is the case where the incident angle is zero degrees and the light will just continue propagating undeflected. 
Now, I drew these three rays. I drew these three rays for a specific reason. Um, if I have an object here, so usually in optics you draw the, op the object like an arrow. So this is my object, it could be a person. Yeah, so we'll make it a person today. Okay, so this person is standing here. And there's a light source somewhere over here, like the sun, and it's shining its rays at this person. So this person is acting as a source, or sorry, the sun is acting as a source, and this person is acting as an object, and there are rays that are emanating from certain parts of the person. So let's look at, let's say, the person's hair. So the different angles of rays coming from the sun, as it interacts with the person's hair, are going to pass through and follow these trajectories. The place where all of these rays meet back up is the place where the image is going to be created. So the lens is going to create an image of the person's hair at this spot. Now if you trace other rays, like if I did the same three rays, so these three rays are the important rays. You draw one, ax one ray that's parallel to the optical axis, one ray that passes through the very center, and one ray that passes through the focus. And where those three meet up on the other side will determine where that object creates its image. So this person is going to have an image that's upside down, All right? Because if I shine a ray that goes by their feet, it's gonna show up along the optical axis, okay? So this is the basic principle of imaging with a lens. There are two other important geometrical quantities. There's what's known as the image dist or the object distance O. Sometimes it's called S. So it's the distance from the object to the lens. And there's the image distance I, which is the distance from the lens to where the image forms. Okay, now we're gonna get into geometry. So we need to, yeah, O is the distance from the person to the lens. I is the distance from the lens to where the image forms. So now we're getting into geometry. So the first geometry we want to figure out is, okay, this person has a certain height. They may be six feet, so I'm six feet. My image, which is upside down, is going to have a different height. I might be magnified, so we're going to call it H prime. It's a new height. So we want to figure out what is the new height relative to what the true height of the person is. And to do this, we're going to use similar triangles. So I need to label some triangles. So this is going to be point A, B, the center here is C. This point I'm going to call A prime. This point I'm going to call B prime. So if I look carefully at these two triangles, there's a right angle here, there's a right angle here. There is some angle here, and this is a vertical angle. So these two angles are congruent. So I have two right angles that are the same. I have two congruent angles. The third angle also has to be congruent, right? So these two triangles are now similar by angle, 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 right? So I can say triangle ABC is congruent to triangle a prime, B prime, C. C and C prime are the same <laughs> at one point. So based on that, I can talk about proportion. So the ratio, this height, has to be proportional. So these two triangles are proportional to each other. So the ratio of the new height to the old height is equal to the ratio of the new horizontal length, I, to the old horizontal length, which is O. Now I'm going to put a minus sign here. The reason that I put a minus sign is because the object or the image is inverted. It's going downwards, right? So this is an activity, or at least the focusing, is an activity that can help reinforce concepts from geometry, reinforce these math concepts. So the first relationship is that the magnification, which is the ratio of the new height to the old height, is negative the image distance over the object distance. So what that allows me to do, if I have a very small object and I have a lens and I position it correctly, I can project it onto the wall. Actually, your projector is the exact example of this. There's a very small chip inside the projector, about a one inch size, 
it goes through the lens and you get this image that's several feet tall. So it's going through this magnification system where the magnification is negative I over O. Okay? So that's the first step. The second step is to figure out, well, how far is I if I know the distance O? So typically I have my lens, I have my object, it's a certain distance from the lens. How do I calculate where is this image going to form? And for that, we're going to do a second pair of similar triangles. So for this second pair of similar triangles, what I have to look at is, oh, I've already forgotten it now, so I, used, so I used this triangle already. There should be one more triangle that I'm using. I believe it's this triangle. So I need point D and, um, shouldn't have put myself on the spot, and this triangle. So I need to call this E. I hope these are the right two triangles. I'm going to go through this derivation, and then I'll be disappointed that I did or did not get the right two triangles. Um, those two, OK. So this is parallel to this axis. This is parallel to this axis. Right, so these two are parallel. This angle is congruent to this angle. Um, yeah, and this is a shared angle. So this angle, I'm going to put five marks, is congruent to itself. All right? Okay, so now I have these two triangles. So I have one triangle that looks like this, and this is A prime, D, and A. And I have a similar triangle, so I have angle, 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 where I have A prime, E, and C. Okay, because these are similar, it's always great to be thinking as you're deriving rather than having this color known of, say it again? Color chalk, chalk would help. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so I have the focal, okay, so I have the object distance in my picture, I have the focal distance in my picture, um, and I'm missing something missing this distance. Oh, no. Uh, OK, I figured out the problem. I actually need to draw another triangle. So this derivation would be much better. Yeah, I believe it would be much better if I draw this triangle. All right, so all right, this is going to be point F. So I want to use similar triangles again. So this time I'm going to use this triangle. This is one of the triangles, and this is the other triangle that's going to go up here. Oops, go this way. Okay, so these are similar. We have a right angle here, a right angle here. This angle is congruent to itself. This angle and this angle are the same. So let me go through this derivation. So we have triangle A, F, a prime is congruent to triangle, um, or not congruent, this should be similar to. Yeah, I think I used the wrong similar or symbol. Is it? I haven't done geometry in so long. Okay, I had it, I was close. It's similar to, all right. It's been 20, 30 years. All right, so angle A, F, A prime is, con or is similar to Triangle C, B prime, A prime. All right. So what I wanted to get was the ratio, the horizontal length. So the horizontal length AF, which is equal to O plus I, that is to the horizontal length C, B prime, which is equal to um, I as the vertical length FA prime, which is H plus H prime, is to the other vertical length BA prime, which is equal to H prime. All right, so now I have this equation. 
O plus I over I is equal to H plus H prime over H prime. Ah, OK. This is not going to work. <laughs> I need to come back to this derivation. I'm going to end up deriving that the same equation with the magnification I'm realizing from this. I need to think about how I derive the other one. There's a pair of triangles. I'm not seeing the correct ones. But the equation that we eventually want to derive, which we also use the magnification formula from, um, will eventually derive 1 over O plus 1 over I equals 1 over F. And I'll record, so we'll cut all this stuff from the video. I'll record, <laughs> I'll record me getting it right in the first step. Um, but basically, the result that we want to derive is this. And I remember I derived this like a few weeks ago. I need a second pair of similar triangles. The similar triangles need to have the focal length f in them. And I need to use the relationship that I already derived, which talks about the magnification. So those three things together allow me to get that formula. OK, so I'm going to derive that on a separate video. All right, so let's do the activity now. <laughs> so what we want to do is we want to build an optical projector. So our optical projector, what it needs to work, it needs a lens. It needs a light source, and it needs an object. And we need to project something on the wall. So our light source is going to be a flashlight. Our object is going to be a small cut piece of transparency, and then a lens. Now, we need to somehow hold all this together. So I skipped the session on engineering design. Um, I'll pass out the handout so you can read that on your own if you didn't receive the electronic copy. Um, there isn't anything we're going to cover in engineering design today. It's just for you to read to understand what the process is. So engineering design, um, many people have different definitions of it. I'm going to call it three different steps. So there's a define step where you define what the problem is. There's a solve step where you solve it. And there's a prove step where you are making improvements. So in this activity, I went through engineering design many times. So this activity, the goal is how can I hold a flashlight, a transparency, and a lens in such a way that I create a projector, and the user has the ability to adjust this object distance and see its effect on the magnification and see the effect on the image forming distance. So the goal for the engineering design or the constraints were I want to create the system that holds these things together. I want it to be cheap, so I'm going to use paper, staplers, I'm going to use uh, uh, flashlights that are a dollar a piece. I'm going to use lenses that are a dollar a piece in order to create this activity. And it needs to be robust. And so I've gone through many iterations. I think the first time we did this activity was 2015. And every year, we've iterated and improved. So we've gone to the point where we believe it's self-sustaining. And we're going to test it out to see if it's fully self-sustaining before we print the copies for the STEM clubs. So the assistants are going to pass out um, the flashlights, the um, uh, printouts. And then there's going to be three lenses, three different types of lenses. So one lens type per table. And there are, so what your STEM clubs are going to receive, um, you're going to get 50 copies of the parts that make the projector. You'll get two copies of the part that's going to make the holder. So this is basically you have to divide this up and cut it out, and the students are going to get their own individual pieces. And then you'll get two copies of the transparencies, and that, or one copy of the transparencies, and that has enough for 40-something uh, students. So someone gets to volunteer to be in charge of cutting this first one. Give it to Erica. Um, so, so you're cutting. So you're going to cut along the center, yep. and then you're going to cut each one of these oh, horizontally. Okay. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and then distribute one piece per teammate. And actually, I don't think you need to cut the whole thing. We just need twelve. Okay. So, yeah. however many to make twelve. Um, so the other tables, we get a volunteer at each table. So one person at this table gets to cut out the transparencies. So who has a steady hand? Yeah. You can do cutting. All right, so you want to cut along the dotted line. And we need 12 total. So you don't have to cut them all up, but you essentially want to cut out each one of these individually. Someone at this table gets to cut the blank ones. So if students want to draw their own object and then project it on the wall, this is the place for them to draw. So we need to cut 12 pieces of that. All right, 
So the people who are not doing the community cutting, um, you can do the actual activity. So all the instructions for the activity are on the activity itself. So it's a self-contained activity. Um, I'll walk you through it just so that you don't have to read or get confused. Um, you're going to cut horizontally and separate this into two sheets of paper. You cut the top line to get rid of this excess at the top. You're going to fold the very center, so fold it outwards, and then cut out this black rectangle here, cut out this rectangle, cut out this rectangle. Then you're going to start folding this back and forth and form the letter M, and then we'll talk about the next steps. There it is. All right, so let's discuss um, some of the things that the students uh, should be able to see. So the first and probably the most important thing is to know what the focal length of your lens is. Um, so they're labeled. Um, they're either 5 centimeters, 10 centimeters, or 15. If you don't know what they are, you can use a light source. And when you're a distance of a focal length away, um, unfortunately, this light is not the best. Um, maybe I'll do it on the table. When you're focal length away, you should get um, basically a bright spot. So this one, I believe, is a 10 centimeter, no, 15. This one's a 15 centimeter focal length lens. So your object. It's interesting to me that everybody's upside down when I'm in trouble. Yep. And that's that, so that's the flipping of the image uh, from this picture. So when you look through the lens, people will look upside down. So the, let me ask, is it so, I know, is this is a convex lens? Um, it's, con it's convex on both sides. Okay, yes. so that's the difference between a pair of eyeglasses. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that you're not seeing those upside down. Um, a little bit that, um, yeah. So we didn't get into all this divergent okay. lens, convergence. Yeah, the eyes also act as a lens, and the eyes also flip something upside down, and your brain undoes that flipping upside down. <laughs> so, so yeah, so your eyes naturally um, acting as a lens, the image formed on your retina is upside down, but your brain knows that, and so it flips it inside the brain. So then, if you flip it one more time with a lens, your brain doesn't know that, and so it looks upside down. But what about your the glasses won't flip it upside down. The glasses are designed such that the magnification is a positive number. And so the glasses don't use biconvex lenses, so convex on both sides. Um, they use a combination of concave and convex. Um, yeah, and they're also not, yeah. So there's, there's engineering that has to go into the shape of the lens so that you get the right uh, magnification. OK, so let's talk about uh, what we should be able to do and demonstrate. So this lens being 15 centimeters, we want to place our object at a distance of 15 or greater. If you place it less than 15, um, you'll form what's known as a virtual image. The image will actually appear to be on the same side of the lens as the object itself. That's useful if you're going to cascade multiple lenses, but not useful for a projector. For the projector, you want to have your object a distance further than the focal length away. So with 15 centimeter focal length, I'm going to place this at roughly 18. And then I'm going to put my flashlight uh, to illuminate the object. And then somewhere off in the distance, so about here, I see the objects in focus. So right about at this distance, maybe I would say two yards away, so about 72 inches away, the object is in uh, focus. So what your students can do, they can measure how big the object is in the object plane. They can look at how far it is away so they can record two quantities. So what your students should try to measure is they should measure H prime and they should measure I. They should measure how big is their object and how far away was it. The transparency itself, it has dimensions of those lines in inches. So the black line is exactly one inch long. The red line is three quarters of an inch and so forth. So they can compare how big the height is, so this is the input. You know how big the height is. You know how far you are from the lens. And based on these two quantities, you can use this formula to calculate what the image distance is. And you can check, did it focus at the right position? If it didn't focus at the right position, you can ask questions like, well, what is less than optimal in the setup? And one of the things that's going on is that the flashlight itself is not an ideal source. Ideally, you want light that's coming as a collimated beam that's like 
not diverging and it just looks like it's a far away illumination. Because the LED has lenses, the light's actually diverging as it's coming out of the flashlight. The size of the image is not constant. So these assumptions that went into this derivation are not perfect. They're approximately good and your measurements should be close, but they're not going to be exactly this formula. So a discussion point can be when you made your measurement, first of all, what gives you the best accuracy? Placing the object very close to the focal length, placing it further away from the focal length, What's the accuracy in measuring this image distance? How well does it recreate this formula? How well does it recreate the formula that the magnification, which is the ratio of H prime, which you're going to measure, to what you put in, which is H, how well is that equal to negative I over O, the image distance, the object distance? Again, it's not going to be perfect because the flashlight is not exactly a source. The derivation actually should be like if you have a flashlight very far away so it looks like it's a constant size beam, um, then these formulas will work very precisely. So those are some of the things that you can have students do to see whether they understood the topics and whether they understood the concepts. Um, there was another question that Stephanie had asked and I forgot what it was about the demonstration. You know, we were talking about the equation. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. Yeah, so measuring the size on the wall, knowing the size that you put in, and then calculating does the magnification agree. Yeah, so Liz's question. Why did you want to have this further than the crystal length of the... So this formula, 1 over O plus 1 over I equals 1 over F. Um, the object distance is always a positive number. So if, or sorry, I should move this to the other side of the equation. 1 over i equals 1 over f minus 1 over o. So if I place the object distance at a smaller distance than the focal length, this side of the equation, 1 over f minus 1 over o, will be a negative quantity, which will mean that the image distance, instead of projecting an image here, it'll create a virtual image on the opposite side of the lens that you can't actually see. But if you put another lens somewhere down here, you would take the virtual image of the thing that was produced and cascade it to that second lens. So it's a more advanced topic. Um, it's basically how you can do stuff with microscopes. So microscopes consist of multiple lenses. Um, for the STEM clubs, I think the simple thing that you want to say is, um, or that they should look at is, I want to pick O greater than F such, so that I is a positive number, so that I produce a real image rather than a virtual image. So like, like actually what it would do is it's not going to make an image. Yeah, so we can, we can, so what I can show is like if I place this at, let's say, 8, this focal length is 15. So what happens is if I look for where it comes into focus, no matter how far I go away, I never get some image that's projected in focus. What happens is the image is produced actually somewhere behind the lens, such that if I put another lens here, then I can create a real image. Yeah, so you get I is negative. And that could be another question that you can ask. So we talk about, you first explain, or the, they first look at and they first study when the distance is greater than the focal length and everything makes sense. And then you ask them, well, consider what happens if you make the distance less. What does it mean if the image distance is negative? So, all right, so let's wrap up this session. Um, so um, we will switch, you guys like the session? Can we, are we allowed to make yeah. these? Yes. Yes, yeah, so you'll, you'll keep, so basically every student will keep the paper and the transparency. Unfortunately, there's only four lens or 12 lenses per school, so they can't keep the lenses. They can borrow the lenses, show it to their parents, bring it back. There's also only 10 flashlights, so again, borrow the flashlight, take it back. Um, I've tried out using my cell phone as the illumination source, and it doesn't work as well because the light from the cell phone diverges much faster than the flashlight. So the formulas are actually a lot worse in terms of, of matching. So the flashlight is, is sort of the best approach that I've come up so, yeah. with so far. Can you get it to focus? Can you get with a cell phone? Yeah, the cell phone will work. You'll create an image. The problem is like the distances you calculate won't agree with what you expect. For showing the parents, they probably wouldn't want to do the math for parents. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is we talked about the students making videos, so they can do the video at school. 
Um, one of the things you can explore with the school students um, is that you have different focal length lenses. So they can do the image with the 5, they can switch to the 10, they can do it with the 15, and see how does that change the way that the image is formed. You have to be farther away than the focal length. You have to be farther away to get a positive real image, yes. Um, how much are the lenses? Um, the lenses in bulk are a dollar a piece. Um, the shipping is like 60 cents a piece when you order like 100 of them. So I paid like $85 in shipping for um, 300 lenses. We'll have how many? Um, each STEM club will get 12 lenses, four of each, or sorry, yeah, four of each focal length. Extra money that we would have to. Yeah, so if you wanted to uh, splurge and have every student take home their lens, sure. We can, you can do that with the, with the spare funds. Yeah, part of what, I, part of the, the flexibility with the free funds is that you can pick things that either enhance the experience of a single activity, allow you to do new activities, or to go into more depths and be able to merge activities. You can buy consumables, sure. Yeah. So. How about these sheets? Yeah. Oh, the sheets, yeah. I will, each uh, kit will have 50 of the sheets, and you'll also have the electronic copy if you need to print additional ones. Yeah. <laughs> The transparency is the expensive part. The transparency is like 75 cents per sheet to print in color. So it's, yeah, yeah. But all right, so let's switch gears. Um, so I'm a bit behind on schedule. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to switch from this projector. Oh, how to put things away. OK, so yeah, so put the lenses back into their plastic bags. It doesn't have to be exactly the plastic bag. Um, the lab assistants will collect the flashlights and the lenses. The other parts are yours to keep. Um, you can test out whether your glasses uh, can act as a lens, see whether that, that works or not. Um, the other thing I mentioned with engineering design, you can also encourage your students to design a better system. Like, is there a better way to hold this transparency um, than just having the single cutout? Is there a better way to pull these components together um, yeah, things like that.